Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first John Franklin Carlson lecture. These lectures are held in memory of Frank Carlson, professor of physics, who died April 5, 1954. It is a great honor for me to introduce this series <coughs> by introducing to you Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, director of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey. Subject of Dr. Oppenheimer's lecture will be electron theory, description, and analogy. Dr. Oppenheimer. Thank you, Dr. Danielson. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very special sort of privilege to give this lecture in honor and in memory of Carlson, who was, for many of us, a friend, a colleague. It is certainly appropriate that we at the same time that we mourn his loss, uh, try and, and try the best we can uh, to do the kind of thing that he did when he was with us and that he would approve and did approve all his life. It is, of course, incidentally a great pleasure to be here in Ames at a growing and already very famous center of study in many fields, including physics, which was Carlson's specialty. Carlson was a student of mine in Berkeley, and to those who are in this audience who are graduate students, I would recall the earnestness, the intensity, almost the terror with which he underwent the rites of initiation in a great science and the seriousness with which he took this. In those days, he used to say, I have only one wish, and that is to be a good physicist. I think he lived to see that wish abundantly fulfilled. I knew him, I was fortunate to know him as a colleague when he came back to Berkeley, and the two of us had a bit of luck and did some work together that was fun <laughs> and uh, was successful, something that doesn't often happen. <laughs> I knew him in Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study in a very sweet time. His interests were extremely broad. He was professionally, primarily, and always a physicist. But his interests in science were Catholic. Many of you will know, as, as I do, the fervor with which he talked to men expert in other fields. He loved the history of science. He was interested in philosophy, in literature. He was concerned and sensitive to all human problems, and yet very balanced and unfanatic, a real scholar, <coughs> one of the most modest of men, a man with a great gift for teaching, whether it was the young fellow whom he would for the first time show a new subject, or whether explaining to rather highbrow characters what he had just found out. He was loyalty itself and a great friendliness and very funny. He had a wonderful sense of humor which softened the sobriety, the depth, and the sense of pathos and tragedy with which he looked at human affairs. He exemplified, and with a kind of steadfastness which none of us will forget, he established 
that being a scientist is harmonious with and continuous with being a man, being a man of heart, a man of feeling, and a man of knowledge and wisdom. He refuted the notion that if you are a specialist, you are inhuman. He established the fact that if you are a good specialist, that makes you more human. He did more than any number of symposia or elaborate and sophisticated efforts to provide integration to give a sense of the unity of human knowledge because he enjoyed and knew many things from many different fields and in his person proved that knowledge was integral and that we were all brothers with one another, even when we couldn't always understand what we were talking about. He would, I think, have liked the terms of these lectures. He would have liked the thought that a man should come here and tell about physical science and in some way relate it to more general problems because he believed in that. But he was not a shallow man, and he knew that if there are things in the history of, of physics or in the history of physical science that bear on our lives in other respects, that bear on other aspects of science, that bear on human relations or knowledge in general or what is right and wrong, this was a pretty subtle thing, that there was no simple, mechanical way in which you could translate what you had learned in physics and make it applicable to the very different problems that you face in daily life or that you face in political life. He, he would have thought, I think, that human affairs could be illuminated, that they were illuminated by the experience in the cumulative sciences, in what we call science today, uh, but he would have known that human life was far too broad, deep, subtle, and rich to be exhausted by anything that a scientist would find out in his own field. I, I need at this point to ask, can you hear me? Thank you. I, I, what I'm going to say from now on is hard, and I don't want to add to the difficulties of understanding, the difficulties of hearing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Carlson, Carlson himself was an atomic physicist par excellence. He worked during the war on problems of radiation, which were of pressing practical importance and also great theoretical interest in connection with the great establishment at MIT, uh, the Radiation Laboratory. But when he was on his own, his interests were in atomic physics, and it turned out, as always, that the relations between these two fields were formal and full of great analogies, and when he returned to atomic physics, his work was enriched by the experience that he had gotten studying microwaves and how radiation behaves and how you may deal with it mathematically. He worked on the theory of radiation and electrons. He worked on the theory of collisions. And I am not going at this point to give a, a scientific vita. It should be known to you uh, that he was made contributions which we are living with today and which our children will be living with, though they may have forgotten how they came about. Uh, the work with which I was most closely associated that he did had to do with, with the subject of the lecture tonight, electron theory. And I would like to tell the story or part of the story of this. The reason for that is that this is a very odd piece of theory indeed. It is an almost perfect theory. In many contexts, it makes it possible for us to predict what we observe with an accuracy of one part in 10 billion or one part in, in, in a billion or better than that. Um, 
it, uh, it is a theory which is almost closed, almost self-consistent, and almost perfect. It has one feature, and that is if you try to make it quite perfect, then it's nonsense. And this may be a bit of a moral, though I'm not going to draw the moral in any great detail. I would like to tell this as a narrative. I cannot teach electron theory. It's a very hard subject. It's a recondite one. Uh, I can't tell you in detail how one is sure when one looks at the results of an experiment. How one is never sure, but how one is convinced that this experiment means what it says. How when you see a certain black line on a photographic plate, you know that it was made by an electron. How when you hear a count in a counter, or when you see a constellation of crisscrosses in a photographic film under a microscope, you say, yes, that was an electron that did it. Uh, these are part of the cumulative character of science. Namely, these things have been learned really over the centuries. And uh, you go to school, and you, you find out what, what has been learned, and you find out that you can use a sort of shorthand. And instead of saying that curved, that set of drops that is, seems to be distributed along a, a, a curved path and that you've taken a picture of, and it was formed in a gas which was supersaturated and which was exposed to cosmic rays. That represents a positive electron. You just say that's a positive electron or a positron. And there's a lot of learning in that, and I'm going to short circuit it. I'm also going to have to short circuit the mathematical apparatus which we use, not always successfully, to decide what the logical consequences are of an assertion what the content of a theory is, uh, because this also is something that people go to school for many years to learn. So that my description is going to be uh, the kind of thing that, that you have to do in this world. You have to, have to say, I'll tell you a story about it. I hope you believe me. If you don't believe me, I hope you'll be interested enough to spend eight years to find out whether I was telling the truth. <laughs> and I know no other way. And I have the feeling, I have the conviction that, uh, that Dr. Carlson himself believed in these efforts to reach out a hand and try to explain across the great gulf of different experience, different language, um, different interests even, uh, what we were doing, explain that to each other. Uh, but I need to apologize to the many of you in the, aud in the audience who are professional physicists for the lack of detail and rigor, and to the probably rather more in the audience who are not physicists, for what may seem the profusion of detail and rigor. I can't, no, no, no way to come around this. <laughs> um, the, I, I, wish, I wish I did. <laughs> the electron is one of the fundamental particles of physics, and by that we mean only that it has not proven possible, profitable, useful to regard it as made up of something else. It is only one of a rather large number of such particles. My own count at the moment is 24, but physics is one of those subjects in which you have to have a bit of a theory before you can count, because you don't know what, what you're identifying until you have a bit of a theory. It is the oldest, the best studied, in many ways the simplest and one of the very few particles which is stable, that is, which doesn't of itself come apart and disappear into something else. It was discovered about the turn of the century by J.J. Thompson. It is, as you know, the ingredient which gives the chemical and most physical properties to ordinary atoms and molecules. It is very light compared to the nucleus, uh, being about 2,000 times lighter than, than the, the nucleus of hydrogen, the lightest one. Um, and it is probably the only particle in nature which we have a little bit of understanding of. And I have to say that that is, I will come back to saying that though this is a great deal of understanding, it is far from a complete one. <laughs> um, with Rutherford's discovery of the atomic nucleus and Bohr's invention, one got this picture 
which is not right, but which has been so useful that a an atom, an, a chemical atom, consists of a, a heavy nucleus, quite small, 10 or 100,000 times smaller than the atomic dimension, almost all of the mass, and a charge equal to the atomic number. And around this a constellation of electrons, uh, which Bohr rather cautiously said were in, in a certain set of stationary states, and which he pictured rather even more cautiously in terms of, of orbits, of ellipses and elliptical orbits. These orbits being very large compared to the nucleus, their properties determining the chemistry and the ordinary physics of matter. This took a bit of doing, because at the time of the electron's discovery, there were two basic things, two basic theories into which to fit the electron's behavior. One is, was Newton's mechanics, which said that a particle moved so that the mass times the acceleration was equal to the force. And the force on an electron was the electric force, which acted directly on its charge, and the magnetic force, which acted if it was in motion. And the other theory was Maxwell's, which describes how electric and magnetic fields are produced. They are produced by charges. They propagate with the velocity of light. And Maxwell, in his famous equations, said just how that was. So you had a theory that told you how charge produces an electric field and how it, an electron should move in that electric field. This was all fine. It had to be quite radically modified. Uh, but even before coming to that modification, uh, an attempt was made to see if one could understand the electron itself in terms of these two theories, Newton's equations of motion and Maxwell's theory about how charges make fields. And I will say a word about that not because we are worried about it today, it's obsolete, it's wrong, but because it illustrates with a peculiar and rather elementary vividness something that has happened very recently and that is so, so hard to explain that I can only say it happened and can't explain it. The idea was this. Uh, if you have charge-producing field, and field acting on charge, is it possible that the electron itself is a, a, a structure whose own field explains its existence? That is, the charge is, is accumulated in this way, um, and the forces that the charge produces keeps the electron intact. And what also, what else happens when you have an electron that is moving subject to an external force it is also charged. It must be producing a field. It will respond to this field. Well, the, program, the program then looks like this. You say, I have an electron, and Newton's laws tell me that the acceleration, this is the second time derivative of the coordinate, is equal to the force exerted on it from the outside. And then you try to ask, does this thing work at all? Uh, then, you, then you try to ask, uh, what, what kind of, of, uh, uh, of effects will the fact that here is a bit of charge, what kind of effects will they have on the behavior of the electron itself? Well, you start out and say, I don't know how big the electron is, but let me suppose it's about that big. <laughs> and then let me calculate. And then you find that there are two kinds of effects that the field has. One is that the building up of all these electric fields around here gives energy and therefore inertia and mass to the electron. And you think you may be able to calculate this out. And you notice also that when the electron is subject to non-uniform motion, then these fields are altered and new forces are introduced which depend on the motion. Well, all of this in general depends on the structure of this thing. And not unlike what we'll have to talk about later, you find that as you make it get smaller and smaller, the energy of the field gets larger, the mass gets infinite, the effects of the acceleration of the 
complicated motion of the electron become independent of the dimensions of the electron and all other effects vanish. And this equation here becomes complicated by the addition of a term minus two-thirds times the third derivative of x times the square of the charge divided by the cube of the velocity of light. I think sign. Can, is it invisible? Or is it unintelligible? <laughs> well, the physicists of this day, and this is a half century ago, they said the mass of the electron is known. It's not infinite. I will put in the right mass. This is a term which seems to be true independent of how this charge is distributed if it's small enough. And this has the effect of slowing up an electron which is accelerated. And it turns out to have just the effect of taking away from the motion of the electron the energy which the electron radiates when it is in a agitated motion, as an electron in any radio antenna behaves. Now, the only point that I want to make about this equation and believe me, though it may look complicated, it's easy compared to what's coming. The only point I want to make is the following. Uh, if you forget this term, then there are solutions which tell you that if there's a force, the object is accelerated. And if there's no force, and this is zero, then the only solution is a straight line motion. And this is what Newton said. And there's no force acting. The body should move in a straight line, and the electron does that. If you put this in as a correction, there is no correction, because the third derivative of the velocity is zero for a body moving in a straight line. That's right. But if you get smart and say, oh, I, I can solve this equation, then there are solutions of the form. x equals x naught times e to the t over capital T. So that means an electron which exponentially accelerates itself. Hui. And capital T is just given by uh, 2e squared over 3 and c cubed. And it's a very short time, about 10 to the minus 23rd seconds. Well, people have coped with this in a variety of ways. But the obvious answer is that that equation wasn't meant to be treated that way. Because if you treat this as a correction, it never does you any harm. It's small for most motions, and it agrees with experiment uh, when, when you try it out. But if you take it completely seriously, you get an answer which permits a kind of motion that doesn't appear in real life. And this is a, a first sign of the fact that the theory of the electron works only when you regard the charge on the electron as it is, in fact, as a rather small quantity. I should just point out that this denominator here is proportional to e squared. And I will show you another one like that later. Now, in order to, 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 to get on at all with the theory of, of, of the electron, great reforms had to be made and were made in the Newtonian Maxwellian physics. Uh, the first of these was, was the special theory of relativity, uh, which, starting with the idea that signals cannot be transmitted faster than light, redefined the notion of simultaneity, the measurements of interval of space and time, showed that a, a moving object uh, does its stuff more slowly than an object at rest, merely by virtue of being in motion. Um, showed that the ma mass of a body, inertia of a body, increased with its energy content, and so led to the E equals mc squared of Einstein. Um, showed that m definitions of simultaneity, length, and interval uh, all depend on relative uniform motion, and established the fact that it, the phenomena of nature uh, are the same, are uninfluenced by uniform motion, that they will be the same irrespective of whether you set something going or not, and which took over from Newton most of his laws of motion, but with some modifications. 
And this is the first of those great conservative traits in electron theory, but I, which I want to point out. The most important of Newton's laws, the conservation of momentum, the fact that a body in uniform, unacted on by a force, uh, has its velocity and its momentum preserved, the fact that action and reaction are equal and opposite, these were not altered by the special theory of relativity. Only the connection between the acceleration and the velocity, only the relations between mass and velocity were altered. Well, that was one, one great change in the early year, years of the century. Uh, the other is harder to, to describe briefly. It is much deeper. It is incredibly important. And that was the, the discovery of the true nature of atomic mechanics, which in some ways shattered both the Newtonian and Maxwellian framework very much more deeply. And this was the discovery both of the quantum of action and of the place of the quantum in the description of atomic systems. The history is a very long one, but we can summarize it by reminding you that it was a resolution of the dual character of, of light, the character of light as a wave motion, as Maxwell said it was, and as we know from everyday experience with interference and with radio and all the rest of it, and the character of light as always involving a corpuscular, discrete exchange of energy and momentum between light in phenomena where light and matter interact. Einstein discovered the light quanta in the same year that he discovered the special theory of relativity, and 20 years later, a way of reconciling this duality was made not only for light, but for all objects, for all matter, for electrons, for everything else. It's a very practical thing. Uh, the, the wave character of the electron, not only necessary to understand atoms, but is directly related to the kind of bonding that occurs in organic molecules and in, which seems to us so, in, in inescapable a precondition for, for, for life itself. The wave character of the proton is what enables it to get into a heavier nuclei in the sun and the other stars and keeps them shining. The wave character of the neutron is what makes it possible to build reactors with materials available on Earth and have them react. The, this pervades all of nature as we know it. And perhaps the simplest way to to summarize what this, this revolution was, was to say that on the one hand, it established a relation between the dynamical description of, of objects, an electron you may think of, and the wave associated with them. So that if you have anything, it can be a house, but it shouldn't be because it won't be very interesting. But an electron is a good example. If you have anything, and it is, has an energy content E, uh, then this will be related to the frequency of the wave representing the situation by this relation where this is Planck's constant. And if the momentum is P, that will be related to the wave, uh, the, uh, uh, wave number of the wave by this simple relation, the momentum, the wave number, and again this constant of Planck H. So you have a code of translation from the description in terms of particles to the description in terms of waves. And just to remind you, this comes in also in the very basic point that there are a variety of ways of, of, of exploring and objectifying the state of an electron in nature, but they are, some of them, exclusive of others. So that an attempt to make a wave which is very much localized and therefore know that the electron is in a region of space, so uh, that will interfere with the use only of a limited number of limited band of wave numbers or momenta, so that one gets these famous formulae that the latitude, the lack of definition in the coordinate of an electron, the lack of definition in its momentum, have a product which cannot be smaller than this constant. 
And the one we want most is the one about the time and the energy. And we may say that in an interval, delta t, the energy of a system cannot be defined better than is given by this relation. In an inter, if, in a, if, in, if you want a, be a definition of energy in better than this, you must take a time longer than this. Well, those are very rough ways of talking about the wave mechanics, but they, they must suffice to get us into it. Uh, and I need to remind you that, that on the basis of a little bit of relativity and a lot of atomic mechanics, most of the physical and chemical properties of ordinary matter and a great deal of the properties of nuclei, too, composed of neutrons and protons, have found an orderly explanation. Not always a complete one, because things can be too complicated to work out, but one which we believe is in principle adequate. So that the, the whole of, 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 of physics for the last 30 years has been directed toward questions more or less exclusively evoked by doing abnormal things with matter rather than by simply observing its normal behavior. And how is that? Well, in, it's many different things. But you see, these, these relations and Einstein's relation E equals mc squared, these give you another code of translation. And that code says that there is a relation between length and, and time on the one hand, and energy and momentum in the other. Uh, the time can be connected with an energy. A time can be connected with an energy by this, and with a mass by this relation. 